As always, fascists square off against communists. The 1930s was an astonishing decade for political violence. Imagine a generation of young men who'd fought in a war for their country, now without a job. Imagine football hooligans, but for political parties. And of these street skirmishes, one of the most insane took place in 1932. After Jack Lang was sacked by the king, 400,000 demonstrators took to the streets as he prepared for a re-election campaign. At the same time, a fascist group who adored its German figurehead claimed that they had 80,000 members ready to lead a coup if indeed Lang won re-election. Where was all of this taking place? Sydney. Your history teacher never taught you about him, did they? Well, they should have. Rick, what, what are you doing? Morty, we have to go back and stop the army from moving in on Jack Lang. Now, you guys didn't mishear me before. I really did say that the king fired Lang. And that's because Lang was around at a really pivotal time in the history of modern Australia. So the UK didn't just magically grant independence to Australia. Remember, it was actually a set of different colonies who only narrowly agreed to federate for better self-defense and to keep consistent trade policies. I guess, quite literally, that kind of made us the trade federation of the 20th century. You guys wish... Dooku. Your rebellion against Britain was pathetic. Who did you fight with in World War I again? No, when we federated, we didn't at all consider ourselves entirely independent. The British Crown was kept as the head of state, most powers still resided with the states, and when World War I eventually broke out, our rallying cry was to defend the mother country. Now, for most of that war, Australia was led by a Prime Minister called Billy Hughes. He was from the Australian Labor Party. By 1916, the Western Front was stuck in a stalemate, and so Hughes proposed extending conscription for outside the Commonwealth. This resulted in a very heated debate as Hughes allowed Australia to vote on the issue. The question that was posed to the voters was Are you in favour of the government having, in this grave emergency, the same compulsory powers over citizens in regard to requiring their military service for the term of this war outside the Commonwealth as it now has in regard to military service within the Commonwealth? And so it's in this context that Jack Lang enters the picture. And for the next four decades, he dominates Australian politics. So to begin with, Lang was only a Labor member of the New South Wales State Parliament and not the Australian Federal Parliament. For our Yanks, think of him as being in the equivalent of California's Congress. And luckily enough, we have him right here to give a bit of insight into Billy Hughes. That absolute rat tarnished our good name. I joined Labor in the 1890s to fight for workers, not sign them up for death. Oh damn. But yeah, that was representative of a lot of what Labor thought of Hughes's idea. Lang campaigned against conscription, and this put him on the map as an incredibly persuasive speaker. He'd campaign on the street, and standing at 193 centimetres, he earned the nickname, The Big Fella. Yeah, we're really good at nicknames down here. But as for Hughes, his plebiscite suffered a narrow defeat of 51.6% to 48.4%, and the Labour Party split. Those who backed Hughes crossed the floor to form the Nationalist Party, while those who opposed conscription remained loyal to Labour, but were now in opposition. But all of this happened in federal politics. Remember, where Lang actually held power was the state parliament, and in 1920, his Labour Party was still in power. With his high profile criticisms of the Hughes government, the Premier, John Storey, promoted him to be the Treasurer of New South Wales. Now, these weren't exactly easy conditions to be a Treasurer in. The budget was in a strong deficit for funding World War I, and Lang chipped away at bringing that surplus down. Well, actually, I wanted to increase the deficit. During times of hardship, we need more government spending, not less. And so Lang managed the budget quite conservatively, even though he had very different ideas himself. When it was him in the top job, the budget would look very different. Now, in 1921, Story died, and a guy called James Dooley became the leader. However, in the 1922 election, he lost to the Nationalists. Again, Billy Hughes' renegade party, but on a state level. Having lost, Labor opted for Jack Lang to be its leader. And for a powerful and combative speaker, the role of opposition leader was the perfect place for the big fella. Suffice to say that within one election cycle, the Nationalists were taken down and Lang was the Premier of New South Wales. Now, like I said before, even though Lang was quite conservative as Treasurer, that wasn't his preference. 
from his point of view, during hard times the government needed to spend more to stimulate the economy rather than cut expenses. When the depression would happen not even a decade later, this exact approach would start to be used by guys like FDR but was known as Keynesianism. So Lang did some incredibly radical things that were certainly expensive but from his perspective helped the overall health of the economy. So public school fees were abolished so that the entire workforce could get access to some education, war widows with children under 14 were given a pension, and again this wasn't just humanitarian charity but actually an economic move to make sure the state got proper access to its future worker. Jack Lang sounds like a total communist. No, but that's the thing Woody. Wait, why are you weighing in on politics? I was actually meant to make that Stephen Crowder but accidentally clicked on Tom Hanks. Oh well, we're running with it. Obviously, for those on the right, the communist brush was one that they wanted to paint Lang with. However, Lang made it his mission to purge his own party of communism. The best example is this guy, Jock Garden. Now, he was one of Australia's most high profile communists, even making it onto the Comintern Executive Committee and having personal discussions with Lenin. He'd formed the Communist Party in Australia, but Lenin told him it was actually more prudent to infiltrate Labor. With Garden being an influential player in the Australian Council of Trade Unions and also being the Secretary of the Trades Hall, this gave him considerable sway within the party. However, back in 1924, Lang successfully persuaded the Labor Party to ban communists. Now, with Garden having sway within the union movement, some of the unions were put offside by this. As a carrot for them, Lang promised to restore the 44 hour work week that had been increased to 48 hours after World War I. To add to this, Lang added some major infrastructure projects like the Hume Highway and Great Western Motorway, but the real controversial reform was his attempt to abolish the Senate. Now to be technical, the New South Wales Senate is actually called the Legislative Council, but I'm just going to call it the Senate because I'm the one making the video, not, not you. I don't know where that aggression came from, sorry. I've clearly been reading too much about Lang. Anyway, you wanted to get rid of the thing. So there you have it. Jack Lang hated democracy. No, I didn't. In the 1920s, the Senate was chosen by you and not the public. That's right. The governor, that's the person appointed by the crown on advice from the premier to represent them in the government, got to appoint who was in our Senate. They also had the power to dissolve the government. Remember that one. That's important. There was also a precedent for this. The state of Queensland had earlier abolished their Senate. Funnily enough, this meant the Senate voting themselves out of existence and Lang's view was that the Senate slowed down reform and wasn't actually a democratic check and balance. After all, the upper house was modelled on the House of Lords which initially gave the monarch some control in the parliament. So if Jack Lang was going to pull this off, it would require him to persuade the governor, Dudley de Chair, to appoint people who'd vote themselves out of existence. To remove a chamber appointed by the crown obviously went against their interests and de Chair didn't let it happen. However, an agreement was formed to instead let the lower house appoint the senators. Within his own party, there were also issues. In 1926, Lang's deputy, Peter Laughlin, challenged him for the leadership with Lang just narrowly holding on. It didn't bode well for Lang going into the 1927 election and the nationalist leader, Thomas Bavin, took him down, sending Lang back into opposition. And then two years later, the depression hit. Bavin campaigned on a conservative approach as he stressed the importance of saving state money. For Lang, he was the exact opposite, saying that now was the time for increased government spending. One in five Australians were left without a job and Lang argued that to save money by laying off more government workers and contracted builders actually worsened the issue. In 1930, the public opted for Lang as Labor won convincingly. This second term would be the controversial one. Now, Lang was immensely popular with the common folk of New South Wales. Upon returning to government, he refused both lowering government salaries and restricting spending. On top of this, he passed laws that really restricted landlords from evicting defaulting tenants. Like I said before, the 1930s was the era of political gang violence and pre-World War II Nazism wasn't as universally condemned as what it would be. And so the New Guard became the most successful fascist organisation in Australia. Its leader, Eric Campbell, even met with Nazi Foreign Minister Joachim von Ribbentrop. They boasted of around 50,000 members, though this was likely exaggerated. However, they were an absolute menace on the streets of Sydney, frequently clashing with Labor's militia, the Labor Defence Corps. This then drove the police to be extremely loyal to Jack Lang. So as New South Wales slipped further and further into deficit, 
Lang had an idea to get the budget back in black, but it was a controversial one. So Billy Hughes was the Prime Minister until 1923, but under pressure from within his party, he stepped down. This then brought Stanley Bruce to the fold, who governed until 1929, before James Scullin led Labor back into federal government. But I kid you not, just two days later, the New York Stock Exchange crashed, triggering the Great Depression. Now, like Lang, Scullin believed the government needed some spending in a crisis, but was nowhere near as radical in how much he wanted to spend. Scullin proposed a policy called the Premier's Plan. With this plan, each of the six states, plus the federal government, would cut spending by 20% in order to repay the debt owed to Britain for getting equipment from them in the Great War. Lang detested this idea because it went against his idea of spending during a time of crisis and came up with his own Lang plan. Labor was completely divided on the issue, but Scullin faced two huge issues. The first was that the Commonwealth Bank wouldn't approve expanding the line of credit to provide stimulus. The second was to do with a guy called Ted Theodore. Yeah, that was really his name. So apart from effectively being called Ted Ted, he also went by the name Red Ted and was Scullin's treasurer. So Red Ted actually used to be the Premier of Queensland and in 1930, an investigation began into him corruptly approving a mine development. Under investigation, Red Ted stood down as treasurer and was replaced with Joseph Lyons. However, the Queensland government said that it wouldn't press charges against Ted, and so Scullin returned him to his post. Given that he hadn't yet been cleared, Lyons was furious with this and, like Hughes, rallied support from Labor to defect to the opposition. It was an absolute crisis for federal Labor, which Lang capitalised on. Despite Lyons being a supporter of the Premier's plan, Lang encouraged Labor members to pass a vote of no confidence in Scullin. This was because Lang thought his own separatist movement could beat both Scullin and Lyons. Lang was wrong. In 1931, Australia went to the polls and there were three main parties. Scullin's OG Labor, Lyons' new merged party of defectors and nationalists, the United Australia Party, and then finally Lang Labor, made up of Lang's federal allies. Lyons won and pressed ahead with the Premier's plan. Obviously, Lang bitterly opposed this and refused. Why on earth will we pay Britain for making our soldiers die in their war? Even the Gans got a 40% debt reduction from the Brits. And so this is where things get really intense. So in order to force Lang to go along with the Premier's plan, Lyon passed something called the Financial Agreement Enforcement Act. Essentially, this gave the federal government control over state treasuries to pay the war debt, and the High Court was cool with this because it involved federal debt. So that was that then. Lang had no more options, right? Well, not exactly. Lang appealed this decision on the basis of Britain's Anti-Slavery Act of 1833, a law we inherited upon Federation. According to Lang's lawyers, Lyons' law enforcing reduced spending made Lang incapable of paying state employees. Remember, this was all pre-digital currency, and so Lang actually moved the money out of the Treasury and into Sydney Trades Hall, which was owned by the unions. But if Lang was standing up to the might of the federal government, who could possibly protect that hall? Well, now it was time for them to prove their loyalty and protect that coffer, no matter the pressure. Quite frankly, Canberra couldn't believe the resistance that Sydney was showing, and the army was put on high alert. Though the military greatly outnumbered the police, an action against Sydney could possibly require an invasion. Sydney was the home of one million people, many of whom supported Lang and may have supported the police in a guerrilla campaign against the army. Now, remember that royal job title I mentioned before? The Governor. Well, he proves very important in this story. By 1932, the Crown's Governor was a guy called Philip Game, and you might remember that they had one key power, the power to dismiss the government. Now, Game issued Lang an ultimatum, end the resistance or have your government dissolved. Lang ignored this, and so Game followed through and appointed the UAP leader in New South Wales, Bertram Stevens, as interim Premier. Stevens immediately called for new elections. So if this wasn't an intense enough situation, it was reported that 400,000 people protested this decision in the domain, the centre of Sydney. Given that Sydney only had a population of just over a million, this is perhaps a slight overestimation, but it gives you a perspective of Lang's popularity. So as this new election loomed, Lang had two options. One, contest and play by the constitutional rules, or two, arrest the governor on the grounds of states' rights and force a civil war. In Lang's book, Lang said that he genuinely considered arresting game and fighting to the end, but in the context of rallying against Britain signing Australians up to die in their war, a civil war wasn't a worthwhile pursuit. 
Despite Lang's immense popularity, it was just too concentrated within Sydney. Lang Labor was the most popular party with 40% of the vote, but picked up just 24 out of 90 seats. Stevens's United Australia Party received 36% of the vote, but picked up 41 seats. It's worth noting that Federal Labor also ran in these elections, but picked up just 4% of the vote and no seats at all. In 1935, Lang contested Stevens again, and though he made a gain against him, still lost the election. The schism of Labor was clearly hurting them as they were in opposition at both state and federal level, and in 1936, Lang Labor and Federal Labor agreed to merge again under his leadership in New South Wales. So for the third time, Lang contested Stevens in 1938, this time with Labor reunited. But he lost again. Now, it's usually around this point, Lang failing to regain the premiership, that most depictions of the Lang story end. But his epilogue is one of the craziest in Australian history. So Lang didn't give up the title of Labor leader without a fight. Having lost three straight elections, many within the party were calling for his head, and the federal executive actually had to intervene and host a conference where, I kid you not, a fist fight broke out. Could you imagine Rabs giving an origin preview for Labor conferences? State against state. Mate against mate, men who were once brothers in the caucus, now enemies across the aisle. This is Labour of Origin on Channel 9. But at the conference, they decided to let the caucus, that's party members who've been elected into government, cast the vote for their leader. And in September of 1939, they decided to replace Lang with William McKell. Hold up, September 1939? Stewie, look at this. September 1st, 1939. There's something about that date. World War II had started. Embittered about his ousting, Lang started another breakaway party called the Australian Labor in brackets non-communist party. Labor guys, let me know in the comment section below, in this situation, do you join Lang or remain loyal to federal Labor? However, in 1941, he once again reunited with the old party. This was just in time for the 1941 state election where McKell won, returning Labor to government. But, then after that, in his newspaper The Century, Lang attacked McKell's policies. Federal Labor decided enough was enough and expelled him from the party. And I'm still not done. In the 1946 election, Jack Lang ran representing Lang Labor for the seat of Reid in Inner Western Sydney. And he won. As a lone wolf, Lang was bitterly critical of Labor's Prime Minister Ben Shifley, who he called a communist for trying to nationalise the banks. In 1949, he tried to run for a different seat, Blacksland, but failed. In 1951, he tried his luck in the Australian Senate, but also failed. For just about the rest of his life, he remained at enmity with the Labor Party. That was until he started tutoring someone new. Someone who would not only get him back into the Labor Party in 1971, four years before his death, but someone who would pick up the mantle of being the most combative leader in Australia. That man was Paul Keating. Someone who the British tabloids called the Lizard of Oz. Click here to learn all about it.